Here we are. Hi, everybody. Happy Tuesday evening to you. Hello. We got all kinds of things. We've got lots of video this week to go over. Um, some was I was lucky enough, lucky enough to take, and some uh, came through the email inbox. So um, we've only got an hour to get through it all. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, get started uh, with a little screen share. I'm going to make sure we share the audio because uh, one uh, video in particular, you're going to want to hear what these uh, creatures have to say. Uh, so let's go ahead and uh, start from the beginning. All right, enough of that. <laughs> Let's get dive right in with um, the topic from last week's newspaper column, which was butterflies. And if you had a chance to read it, um, you might have noticed or you might recall that I started off with the phrase that butterflies are easy. Um, that's actually a, a phrase I've been telling myself now for over 20 years. Um, there's some topics in nature that are, let's face it, they're kind of hard sells, uh, getting people excited about ticks or leeches, uh, even spiders and snakes. Um, you can work really hard on a program that makes them sound like just the most fascinating and, and reveals just how fascinating they are. Um, and people still walk away going, Bleh. but butterflies by and large are easy. Um, or are they? Um, I have had a few people who told me, you know, I, there's something about butterfly legs. You know, when I was a little kid, one time one flew by me and it scared me. I've had a few people tell me that um, they don't like caterpillars. But um, we're going to focus our uh, segment on butterflies tonight on um, identifying what we're looking at right now. Um, it might come easy to some of you. It might be kind of difficult. Uh, what we're seeing right now, by and large, are types of butterflies that have actually spent the winter in their adult stage, which is uh, kind of a, a trick if you think about it. Um, a lot of butterflies um, might spend the winter time in their uh, pupal stage as a, as a chrysalis. Um, some uh, might be in their, their egg stage or their caterpillar stage, but there, believe it or not, there are a few that overwinter as adults. Uh, we're looking at one of them right now. Um, this is a, a, a member of a group of butterflies called the angle wings. And you can see by uh, the many angles on this wing how they get that common name. This is a butterfly called the question mark. And if you look really closely here at the hind wing on the underneath, uh, on, on the underside of the uh, hind wing surface, you'll see what looks like a little bit of punctuation. It's backwards, but it's still, it's the um, uh, kind of semicircle with a dot at the bottom. That is the mark of the question mark butterfly. Um, it's very closely related to this butterfly here, the comma. Um, and again, there's a little punctuation here at the bottom uh, on the, uh, the back of the hind wing. Um, is that easy to see? Is it difficult? Um, it's something you definitely have to train your eye for. Um, it's also complicated by the fact that um, these two different butterflies um, have a slightly different way of resting. Most butterflies, uh, as these are pictured here, they, they rest with their wings folded up, but angle wings actually have a tendency to rest with their wings uh, extended, which is actually more characteristic of moths than butterflies. But um, especially in the springtime, early spring, when we're seeing these butterflies as they emerge from hibernation, they want to soak up as much uh, warmth from the sun as possible. So they attempt to adopt this posture of sticking their wings out. Now looking at them uh, without the punctuation marks visible, don't they look similar? Um, not so easy, is it? Um, there's a little trick to telling the, uh, the Eastern comma, which is the species we have in this area, from the question mark. One, um, well, a, a simple thing to remember, but a hard thing to apply 
is uh, the fact that a question mark is larger than a comma. Um, we know that from learning our punctuation marks as kids. And in um, real life, as these butterflies are flying around, there is a slight size difference. The question mark is a little bit bigger than the comma. Um, but you can also look at the markings. Um, quick glance, they look nearly identical. But if you start to look a little more closely here at the uh, the upper, the, the forewing on these insects, you'll see here on the comma, there's one, two, three dots uh, on the forewing, the upper surface of the forewing. And over here on the question mark, there's one, two, three dots, and then a bar. One, two, three dot, and then a bar. So if you're quick enough, um, because they do uh, tend to scatter kind of quickly when you when you start to sneak up on them, but if you can catch your eye or even better get a photo of them, you'll be able to tell the difference even if their wings aren't folded and you're not looking at the punctuation part of the wing. Now, to complicate things even more, this is what we would call the, uh, the fall uh, and winter form of the question mark. They, these um, individuals will now mate and lay eggs and produce caterpillars that will then uh, come out of their chrysalis looking like this. The summer form of these insects actually has a darker wing. And I, I don't, I was trying to figure out what advantage this would be. And I, I honestly haven't come up with much. You'd think that the dark wings would be an advantage in uh, the early springtime, that that's when they would want the darker colors to be able to absorb the, uh, the sun's heat a little bit better, but it's not the way it is. These are the summer versions of these insects. And then when these guys mate um, and produce eggs that turn into caterpillars, uh, they will then hatch out in that uh, lighter form again. So uh, two generations a year, the lighter form, which we're seeing now, and then the darker form, which we'll see later on in the summertime. Regardless of whether they're the, uh, the uh, early version or the later version, they, you can still use that trick to identify them. One, two, three dots on the forewing tells us it's a comma. One, two, three dots plus a bar tells us that it's a question mark. Um, I kind of like the, uh, the uh, scientific name for these butterflies too. Polygonia um, sounds vaguely geometric and it does refer to the, that common name of angle wing. Uh, polygonia refers to many angles. And then um, for the uh, specific name, comma, it's the same whether it's the common name or the scientific name. And um, interrogationis um, refers to the question mark aspect of the question mark butterfly. So um, two species that are flying around right now, thanks to their ability to hibernate. Um, this is the other species and perhaps the maybe better known hibernating species in this area, the morning cloak butterfly. Uh, now this, uh, it's kind of easy to see how this insect gets its common name. Uh, it's very dark. Uh, and again, this does seem like it would be a good advantage if you're coming out in late winter and early spring. You'd think it would be very advantageous to have these dark colors to absorb uh, more of the sun's warmth. Uh, but early on, people looked at this and thought, my, that looks like something someone in mourning would wear. So mourning cloak is one common name. In some parts of the country, though, they call it the white petticoat. Um, and I guess that refers to this light colored border. Maybe some people when they're wearing their morning clothes actually have white undergarments. I don't know, but uh, white petticoat, you might encounter that common name in other parts uh, of the United States. But uh, this insect too overwinters as an adult. Um, in some parts of the United States, they only have a single generation. So, um, in, in those parts of the country, the morning cloak uh, ends up getting the title of one of our longest lived butterfly species. Uh, close to a year uh, is its lifespan in those areas. Now, how do they do this, uh, this overwintering? Um, uh, Nymphalini is a little um, reference to the, uh, the, I believe it's the tribe, the taxonomic group that uh, these insects belong to. 
Um, what they do uh, as we get into the, the, as the weather starts to, to cool off in the fall, they start looking for sheltered locations. Oftentimes that's underneath uh, tree bark. Uh, they might go down in leaf litter, uh, but they wanna find a place where they're gonna be protected, uh, not so much from the temperatures, but from wind and other harsh elements, you know, sleet and things that we experience in the wintertime. So they, they look for shelter. Um, so that's the, the behavior they display, but internally their body produces what basically amounts to an antifreeze. They re water in their cells uh, with uh, glycerol, which um, has a much, much low, lower uh, freezing temperature than water. Um, putting glycerol in those cells will prevent the formation of ice crystals. So when the insect's body temperature drops very low, um, they're not going to, those cells aren't going to explode as, as we probably all learned uh, water or cans of pop, <laughs> when you put them in the freezer, uh, it, they expand and sometimes they explode. So uh, replacing the water with uh, glycerol in their cells is going to help preserve um, the integrity of those cells, even when the temperatures get really, really cold. Now, um, over the months, it's going to get very cold, it's going to snow, but again, in a sheltered location underneath the bark, they're not going to have to deal with the, the moisture and the melting that would occur um, if they, the uh, precipitation were to actually touch them. Um, and their body temperature is going to be whatever the ambient air temperature is, could be freezing, could be below freezing, could even be below zero. Um, but that, uh, that antifreeze-like substance in their cells is going to protect them. Uh, and then when we get those warm winter days, we usually have a few uh, days in February. We might not be done with winter yet, but the thermometer will climb up into say the 60s. Generally speaking, insects need a, a, a air temperature of at least 55 degrees in order to be able to fly. So when we get those warmer winter days, it, it might only be a day or two, uh, it's enough to warm them up and they'll come out and they'll start seeking um, sustenance. With the morning cloak, uh, they, they try to find uh, tree sap, which uh, if they're living in an area where people are tapping maple trees, that's an easy thing to do. Some studies have shown that morning cloaks prefer oak sap. Uh, and I suppose if a, a branch breaks off or maybe a squirrel nibbles on a branch or something and, and gets some oak sap flowing, uh, they, they will flock towards that, the morning cloaks were, will do that. Um, the commas and the question marks, they actually, instead of um, uh, tree sap, they'll go for things like animal droppings and mud puddles, uh, and they'll get their, um, their energy and their, the minerals um, that they need to absorb through uh, uh, objects like that. So not so much, there. neither one of them, um, well, I, I guess morning cloaks, they, they will go towards spring ephemerals uh, from time to time, but you rarely will see an angle wing butterfly on a flower. They're looking more for uh, delicious things like scat <laughs> to get what they need to survive. Um, now, this picture I, I took, um, I was actually on vacation when I took this a couple of years ago. This was in the Red River Gorge in uh, Kentucky. And uh, I was sitting, uh, looking over towards an area they call the Natural Bridge. And I looked um, over uh, on this particular rock and there had been several groups of hikers that had come before me uh, and sat down there, looked at the Natural Bridge, then got up and left. Um, I suspect, and if we look closely at this butterfly, we'll see um, that its tongue in front here is extended. I think that it was collecting the salts from the sweat from the people who had been sitting on this rock. Kind of the story behind the story on that photograph. Uh, and we can tell again that this is a, a question mark by the, uh, the punctuation there on the hind wing. Something else about um, all of these butterflies, the, the morning cloak, the comma, the question mark. In fact, this even extends to other <clears throat> groups of butterflies like, uh, like the monarchs, they um, <clears throat> belong to a group of butterflies called the brush-footed butterflies. So in, as insects, 
They're supposed to have six legs. And in fact, they do. But with the brush footed butterflies, you only see four legs. The, the two four legs, the, the two legs that are at the very front of the body are very much reduced. And in some species, the feet on those reduced legs have little tiny hairs that look like little brushes. Um, there's some thought that maybe uh, those brush feet um, serve a sensory. Uh, I've heard some people say, oh, you know, some butterflies will be able to taste things with their feet. Um, that may be the case in some species. It's not the case with all the, the species of brush footed um, butterflies. And to be perfectly honest, there's not a consensus as to why those uh, front legs have been reduced. But brush footed butterflies, there's actually uh, several different uh, genera that belong to that group. And um, it's just kind of an, an interesting side aspect. When you look at a butterfly, look and see how many legs you see. If you see four, chances are you're looking at a brush footed butterfly. If you see six, it would belong to one of the other uh, groups of butterflies. Now, uh, Larry Rakunis, you sent this photo. This is another butterfly that's flying right now, uh, but it has not uh, hibernated or overwintered in its adult stage. This is a cabbage white butterfly. This is another one of those species we call cosmopolitan because it's really made its way across uh, many parts of the world. Um, you can tell by its common name, cabbage white, what it's uh, primary food sources for its caterpillars. Um, these insects will lay their eggs on uh, members of the, the cabbage family. And uh, in some areas, I guess they can be kind of pesty if there's a, a number of adults present laying a number of eggs. But these um, uh, butterflies overwinter in the, the pupil stage. So they they made their chrysalis last fall. They overwintered in that. So only need a little burst of warm uh, weather in order to be able to um, come out as adults. So we are seeing, if you see a white butterfly flying these days, chances are very good you're looking at a cabbage white. Um, and this one, I look at the camouflage, it's just exquisite on this daffodil there. You can barely see it. So good eyes, Larry, for picking this one out. Now, um, we're going to switch gears to something that's had me scratching my head now for about a week. I actually consulted my friend Tim Balassi to get his viewpoint on this too. This was an email I received last week. Um, this gentleman um, was part of our King County Certified Naturalist group a couple of years ago, and he uh, he lives over in the Davis School neighborhood, not too far from me. He wrote um, that uh, he his wife had taken this video in their backyard, and it shows two great horned owls. Now, you know what great horned owls are up to right now. They uh, were nesting uh, back in January and February. Now uh, we're almost to the middle of April. A lot of those, uh, those little owlets are now starting to leave the nest. They're in a, a stage that we refer to as branching. They're developing the muscles in their wings. It probably won't be too much longer before those young owls are starting to fly. So um, that makes this video we're about to see even more curious because the behavior as Tim refers to, uh, it is very late for a pair to be hooking up. Um, and um, I'll tell you what, let's take a look at the video and you guys can draw your own conclusions. Turn your sound up if you've got it. Um, so we've got two owls. They're clearly interested in each other. Thank <laughs> you. 
He's moved. There he is, up at the top of the screen there. So what's going on? Um, if you listened to the, uh, the hooting of the owls, you could hear there was, there was a clear difference in the pitch of those calls. The slightly higher pitched call was that of the female and the slightly lower pitched sound was that of the male. Um, they're very, very interested in each other. And um, there's a few things to consider. So one, um, humans like to categorize and organize things in, we slot our great horned owls as being early, early breeders. Um, sometimes things happen. Sometimes a nest fails. If, there's a, if a pair feels like there's enough time to start over again, they will do that. And that could be the case in this situation. Um, another scenario might be that these are two young owls. Now this neighborhood is actually produced, um, uh, there, there's been a, a pair of owls in this neighborhood for several years. Um, last year they produced three owlets. Um, and I heard those young owlets begging through most of the summer. They were in the, uh, the field at Davis Park and uh, we'd hear them. And when I'd be walking my dogs late at night, I'd hear the, the kind of, it almost sounds like a cat whining or crying. It's kind of a meow, 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 of the baby owls waiting, the young owls waiting for their parents to bring them food. Um, I heard one of those owlets as late as December still displaying that immature sound. Um, and I don't know if these are the other two siblings, if they are just kind of practicing. That was the other thought that Tim Balassi had was that maybe these are not uh, fully mature yet, and they are just kind of, you know, they've got this these weird hormones, just like teenagers. You know, they're they're like, well, we, I feel like we should be doing something, but I don't know exactly what it is. But this is a Tim, um, the neighbor who sent this video said this is a nightly occurrence. So um, you haven't quite figured it out yet, but um, it's certainly a curiosity. And if it does, if this does progress to a nesting stage, um, I will certainly let you guys know. But uh, just because um, the, the, the guidebooks and the websites say that owls breed in January and February, um, it doesn't mean that the owls have read that and are following those instructions. So anyway, just kind of a cool thing. Um, use your ears in your own uh, settings, in your own neighborhoods, and um, maybe you can hear some curiosities like this too. Now, um, <sighs> Long time ago, uh, my friend Valerie told me that when you put a bird feeder in your yard, it's almost as if you're issuing an invitation to a party. Uh, the only thing is you can't control your guest list. Uh, any of you who have bird feeders, you're fully aware of this. You might get birds, you might get squirrels, you might get opossums, you might get raccoons, you might get deer. Um, Pretty much anything goes when you put out free food like this. Um, but this next video shows that there's some, some neat surprises that can occur at this time of year. Um, this is a, a suet feeder. And normally when you put a suet feeder out, you expect uh, your woodpeckers, your nuthatches. Um, but you know, as we get into springtime, you just don't know what's going to show up. Um, this uh, was sent by a, a reader out in Sugar Grove. Um, everybody get a good look at that bird. It's brown thrasher um, having a, a nice little suet meal. Uh, now thrashers, 
the first time I saw a thrasher, I did a kind of a double take because I honestly thought it was a thrush on steroids. Um, thrashers are um, a, a good sized bird. Remember last week we talked about grackles. Grackles and thrashers are about the same size. Thrashers might even be just a little bit bigger. Uh, they've got a very long tail. They've got a, a, a large bill as well. In fact, their um, uh, genus name refers to that, toxostoma. Uh, toxo means bowed or bent, and stoma means opening. So they, uh, the thrashers um, as a group, they've got long curved bills. Uh, rufum, uh, the species name refers to the rufous or red color of the bird. Uh, but this heavily uh, speckled breast is uh, another characteristic of the brown thrasher. Um, I threw this uh, picture in. Uh, this was a, a fish and wildlife photo of a wood thrush. Uh, thrushes, by and large, have a speckled breast as well, but it's um, truly speckled, not these um, streaks like we see on the thrasher. And I thought I was probably the only person in the world that had my thrashers and my thrushes mixed up. But then I started doing a little digging and I found out that um, the thrasher over the years, in fact, Linnaeus, um, Carl Linnaeus, our father of taxonomy, he actually had classified thrashers uh, in the uh, Turdidae or the, the thrush family way back when. He'd given it uh, the common name, uh, I'm sorry, this uh, generic name of Turdus, thinking that it was a type of thrush. And um, Mark Catesby, another early naturalist here in uh, the United States, he also called, I believe he called it the fox color thrush. Um, but uh, these birds are, are not that closely related. They're in distinctly different families. The thrasher is part of the mimidae, which are, um, our cat birds are, are in the mimic family too. Um, these are the birds that have just the most fascinating songs because they incorporate the sounds of other birds. Listen to this riff by this thrasher. If you can pick out the sounds of other birds, um, it's mimicking the sounds of other birds. Sweet, sweet, sweet. <laughs> All right, you know, I'm gonna cut that off there. That recording is actually over eight minutes long, but if you hear that sort of extended babbling in it, you're, you're listening to it and you're like, oh, I think I heard a robin. Oh, I think I heard a song sparrow. Wait, what was that? Is that a cardinal? Like, and, but none of it sounds exactly, or it doesn't sound quite right. Chances are you're listening to one of uh, the members of the mimic family. And uh, right now the brown thrashers are back. I. I don't know that the catbirds are back yet. Catbirds also do these wonderful long riffs incorporating lots of um, imitations of different uh, bird song. But um, if you've got bird feeders and you've got suet out, keep your eye open. You might be lucky enough to be visited by a brown thrasher. Now, um, I also included here the song of the wood thrush. Um, this is a song, gosh, I associate it with, with warm, humid, early summer evenings. Um, the first time I heard it, um, I actually thought somebody was playing a flute in the woods. Listen to this song, it's just beautiful. Kind of a really. can almost feel the warm summer air. Whoa, how did I do that? Um, the, um, the wood thrush is, um, the family is turdidae, that's the thrush family, but they're actually in their own genus. They're the only species that's a member of the Hylocycla 
uh, genus, um, that word actually means wood thrush. And then mustelina refers to the color of the bird. Um, mustelids are weasels. And so this is the weasel colored wood thrush <laughs> um, is how that scientific name translates. But um, they uh, are not back yet. Uh, and they are a bird that is smaller. You can look to um, the difference in the shape of the bill. Um, this is a uh, much finer and in a very thrush-like bill. Robins, by the way, are also um, members of the thrush family. So uh, uh, if you can picture a robin's bill on a bird with speckles, uh, you know you're looking at a type of thrush. Now, all right, I kind of jumped the gun here, um, looking at our next slide. So. Um, I was at my mom's house last week uh, doing some, some yard work, getting things ready for um, spring and summer. Uh, for years, my parents have had uh, wren boxes in their backyard and kind of a, a ritual in uh, the spring is getting those houses spruced up and ready for uh, hopefully the, uh, the occupants that are uh, still to come. So I was cleaning the wren boxes um, and I noticed that uh, they were just really full of sticks, which is typical, and also spider egg cases. Um, these were the, the two nests that I pulled out of the two boxes. All those little bits of fluff are spider egg cases. And you know, we've talked before in, in um, previous programs about uh, how bird nests, each species has some sort of signature that they apply. Uh, the chipping sparrow will line their nests with hair, um, which leads to their other common name of um, uh, the hair bird. <laughs> uh, robins always glue their grasses together with mud. Phoebes use a lot of moss. Well, uh, a lot of house wrens use spiders. And I thought, well, that's a, that's a really smart thing to do because you put a lot of spiders in your nest and those spiders are gonna hatch and they're gonna eat the mites and all the other things that can also be living in your nest and it's going to keep your babies healthy. And you know what, I was wrong. Uh, I found uh, a couple different studies that look at, looked at the success rate of house wrens that incorporated spider uh, egg cocoons in their nests. And it turns out it didn't really give them any advantage at all. In fact, uh, male, and by the way, house wrens, the, the nests are built by the males. Um, the male will build several nests actually as a sort of enticement to a female. And then it's up to her to pick the one that uh, she feels will be best to raise their offspring in. Um, and uh, males that decorate their nests with spider egg cases, turns out it doesn't give them any advantage at all. And in fact, sometimes those nests are less likely to be chosen by females. Uh, there was another study that looked at whether those egg cocoons maybe serve as a sort of a cushion or, you know, uh, make the, uh, the sticks softer for the, the eggs or the female or the uh, little hatchlings to nestle in. Turns out that wasn't the case either. So the reason for why house wrens uh, incorporate spider, and not all house wrens do it either, that's the other part of this, um, but it's, it's still sort of a mystery of what those spider egg cases are doing in those nests. So what are they thinking? We're still not quite sure. But if you have any thoughts on that, love to hear from you, see what you think. Now, uh, the other day I was walking to work and as I so often do, I get distracted. And what I saw, look at the little insects that are flying around. Now look at these holes in the ground. Oh, look at my dog. 
All right, that's tech support puppy offering his opinion of what's going on there. But the the action of the insects flying around caught my eye. You usually see that in one of like maybe three scenarios. One, there's something dead lying there and there's flies circling around it. Later on in the season, as we get into summer, uh, especially late summer, you see insects hovering like that. Chances are it's yellow jackets and you want to avoid the area because they're going in and out of their underground uh, nest. Um, and then we have the third scenario and that's what this is. These are ground bees. Um, springtime, early spring is when a lot of our um, ground nesting bees become active. Um, they've got a lifespan of about a year, but their active period above ground is actually uh, only a few short weeks in the springtime. So uh, I got poker, tech support puppy out of the way, and I found a bee on the ground looking for just the right hole. Um, I think these are the right one. No, that's not quite the right one. Um, is this the right one? Bingo. So. Uh, I believe these are uh, Colides is the um, the genus. I, I haven't um, uh, keyed these out specifically, but Colides is a species, uh, I'm sorry, a genus that is um, active right now. These are also known as plasterer bees because they line the inside of their tunnels um, with a, it's almost like, some people call them cellophane bees. It almost looks like a, a, a plasticky sort of material. Um, it improves the, uh, the durability and the waterproofness of those underground um, channels that they dig. So it's the female that does this excavation. And this goes down several inches. Um, she will provision each of these little chambers uh, with pollen and then she'll lay an egg on top of that. Uh, again, this, this all happens in early spring. She dies after uh, a, a few weeks, and then those eggs uh, stay underneath the ground. Um, they develop uh, a year from now, they emerge, and the cycle starts all over again. Uh, this, um, in fact, I noticed that we, we have a different species of ground bee out here in front of Good Natured World Headquarters. It's a much smaller hole and a much smaller bee. Um, you'll notice in that video, the, the bees that were, were um, walking on the ground, those are, those are the females, the ones that are actually going down into the chambers, those are the females. The, the bees that you see circling above, those are the males uh, patrolling the area. So it's, it's something kind of cool uh, to keep an eye out for, and it, it's a, a very short time frame. Um, and once we get into uh, May, uh, this is all going to wrap up and they're going to be done for the year. I should also mention, yes, they're bees, uh, but no, they're not um, likely to sting. They, uh, they're solitary. Uh, you might have a lot of holes in one area and that would suggest maybe some sort of, of colony, but each of those holes belongs to a separate individual and um, other than um, nesting together, um, because of the, the soil being favorable, it's an easy to dig in, um, usually a, a well-drained type of soil. Um, that's the reason why they're all together. They're not there because they're social, they're there because they found the right kind of soil that they need to dig in. Um, the next day when I walked to work, I passed the same sidewalk, but it was raining. And I thought, I wonder if these bees fly in the rain. Well, no, here's the same burrow. Uh, she's kind of closed up for the day. Uh, she pulled um, a lot of soil and, and closed that hole up. Um, and uh, then the day after that, when I walked by, when it was dry again, um, it was open for business once again. So um, dry day, wet day. Um, but uh, one other thing, this looks very, very much like an anthill. Um, but again, this time of year, when you're seeing this sort of activity, chances are good that rather than ants, what you're seeing is actually the activity of our ground nesting solitary bees. Pretty cool, huh? So it's no coincidence that um, these bees are active at this time of year. Um, 
this is um, the uh, we're kind of right in the middle now of our spring ephemerals. Um, this uh, some of the nature nerds that have tuned in tonight, you might recognize these trout lilies. Um, these are growing. This particular patch is along Route 25 at Bennett Park in Geneva. Bennett Park is known, if, if you've driven by there, um, you might see the tremendous display of daffodils. Uh, those have been growing there for several years, um, but there's a story behind the story, and that is our native woodland wildflowers that are underneath. Uh, the trout lilies there um, are in full bloom right now. Um, Trout lilies are an interesting plant. There's a lot of folklore associated with them. They, they've been used medicinally for uh, anything from uh, uh, covering of wounds and helping to heal wounds um, to uh, forms of contraceptives to uh, curing digestive or gastric problems. Uh, so I don't recommend any of those. Uh, sometimes you make a poultice, sometimes you make a tea. I'm not going to get into the specifics of that, but this plant has been used for uh, generations by first Native Americans and then early settlers to cure a variety of ills. Um, the name trout lily uh, supposedly refers to the markings on the leaves. Uh, the leaves are heavily spattered and um, certain species of trout are heavily spattered as well. I've also was told that the feel of the leaf, this leaf, when you touch it, it, it um, got kind of a waxy feel to it. And um, a few people have told me, well, it, it, um, it feels fishy or it's shaped like a fish. So that might also have played into the development of that uh, common name. Um, this, by the way, is the white trout lily. We also sometimes see a yellow trout lily as well. Um, but you can see by the shape of the flower um, how that lily part of the name uh, was developed. Um, also looking at the, the reproductive part of the flower here in the middle, look at all that pollen. That's what those ground bees are going after. Um, they'll go and they'll, they'll collect that pollen. They'll bring it back to those, um, to those burrows that they've dug and they will provision it for their offspring. So uh, trout lilies are um, on display right now. I noticed that our uh, trillium, the prairie trillium, trillium recurvatum is just about ready to open up. That's um, a flower that's got, um, it's aptly named trillium, the T-R-Y or T-R-I at the beginning of the name trillium is tri for the three leaves, the three sepals and the three petals that make up the flower. Um, other um, spring ephemerals like our, um, our bloodroot and our hepaticas, they're actually almost finished, which is, is kind of early to me. Uh, we're, what is today, the 13th of April? Um, my dad's birthday was April 21st, and I always kind of looked at that as, as um, when a lot of the ephemerals are in uh, full bloom. And it seems like we're just a, a little bit early this year. I think that warm weather we had really shot things forward. Uh, you can probably see where I'm going with this next. Uh, this is another reminder if uh, you're in uh, the St. Charles area or if you're planning a trip to the St. Charles area, uh, please consider participating in our spring ephemeral iNaturalist project that we have going on. This is something that um, our restoration ecologists are doing to track we, what we want to um, start formalizing is our collection of data on when these flowers are blooming. As I mentioned, it seems like they're early this year, um, but I don't have the specific dates from years past to compare. Um, iNaturalist gives us, it's a platform that gives us a, a way of having pretty much, um, you know, anybody who downloads that app um, they can contribute uh, to that data set. And then uh, next year, we'll probably do it again. And the year after that, and the year after that, and, you know, on and on and on. And we'll start to see if there are trends that form uh, from the collection of that data. So give it a shot. Uh, we actually have another uh, project coming up as well. It's the last, um, uh, well, it's the first weekend in May, but it starts on April 30th. And that is called the Citywide Nature Challenge. I'll bring you more details on that as we get closer to that. But that is a 
um, a four day um, data blitz where we ask people to visit parks and forest preserves and yards, anything that's within the St. Charles boundaries and take pictures of the nature that you see there. It might be plants, might be animals, um, might be moss, might be fungus, uh, whatever it is, uh, turn it in and we will see how many re uh, records, uh, how many species we can record over that four day period. So I'll be bringing you more details on that as that uh, event gets closer. Uh, now, um, I received this email the other day uh, from a woman who has a few lovely prints from uh, a naturalist named Jean Murray. Um, she's looking to find them a good home. And um, we're not in a position at Hickory Knolls to take them. I uh, checked with a few other nature centers in the area who are not uh, able to take them either. But I thought, you know what? We've got a lot of nature lovers in this group. We've got a lot of art lovers in this group. If you would like to give any one of these uh, prints a good home, um, let me know in the comments or shoot me an email afterwards and we can facilitate that exchange. Um, so looks like we've got uh, some wood ducks, uh, some Canada geese that looks like maybe some uh, redheads there in the lower right and some uh, mallards in the upper right. So anyway, if you don't have art and you'd like some, it's free for the taking. Let me know if you're interested. So um, next week, we've got a really bizarre lineup. Uh, we're going to look at uh, some local parrots that live here in northern Illinois. Uh, I heard from a local resident who's got some curious under the garage guests. Uh, the topic of hammerhead worms has come back. Um, this is a, a introduced species that has a really interesting approach to its way of life and it's uh, living right here in the Tri-Cities. Uh, found some baby fireflies, got some cool video of that, and who knows what's going to come up over the next um, uh, six days or so. So hope that you tune in next week. With that, I'm going to end the screen share and um, show you just a couple other things that came across the desk this week. Um, you never know what's going to show up on the porch here at Good Natured World Headquarters. Um, I'm going to hold this up. Can you see what this is? It's a skull in acrylic. Um, I may have showed this briefly last week, but I've since been able to find out this is the skull of a fox squirrel. Um, we can tell it's a rodent by the general shape of the teeth in the back and then the incisors in the front. Um, and then the incisors are that rodent orange color. Um, I'm gonna use it as a paperweight. Um, I also had a couple of these dropped off. Um, we had talked in the past about, I think that was, was that two weeks ago, we talked about how um, plant stems make great homes. Um, well, here is, um, somebody collected just a whole bunch of these and dropped them off. These are um, goldenrod galls, all of which were uh, predated by uh, probably either chickadees or downy woodpeckers. We can tell that because this exit hole is huge. If the little um, goldenrod fly that was living in here had come out on its own, there would just be a tiny little circle of an exit hole. But here we've got um, uh, a large exit hole. We've got some um, chips around it. So some kind of bird with a, um, a insect uh, or a chisel-like kind of a bill. I'm thinking either chickadee or maybe downy woodpecker had a nice little feast there. All right, with that, I'm going to turn it over to you guys. How you had, how's, uh, how's the past week been? Has anybody made any interesting discoveries or have any questions about things that you've seen over these past uh, few days? Hi, Pam, it's Kay. Oh, hey, Kay. Hi. Um, I. I think I did see a parrot and I thought I was like seeing things. Um, <laughs> it didn't have a long tail or anything, but its entire body was olive and uh, it was on a suet in our, in our backyard and it was probably as big as a robin as far as girth and everything. 
Okay. Was this uh, was this recently, Kay? Within, if it wasn't one week, it was two weeks ago. Okay. Did you get a look at the bill? Um, no. <laughs> did it have, because um, um, the, the parrots uh, we're going to talk about next week have been known to, to occur in Kane County, um, although the, I think the, the, the largest colony of them uh, in this area right now is a little east of here. But the, the bill of parrots are um, belong to a group of birds called the hook bills. And um, it's, it's a, a curved um, kind of a structure. It uh, wouldn't surprise me that they would be feeding on suet though, because um, they eat a lot of insects, um, especially as they're getting into breeding condition and suet um, fulfills that animal fat requirement that they might be looking for. And yeah, my it was way too fast, sorry. And, um, you know, it was just like, all I saw was basically the backside of the bird, but it was definitely interested in, in the and, suet. And it was greenish, huh? Yeah, yeah. the entire body was basically olive colored. Interesting. Okay, well, let me know if it shows up again. Um, yes. And uh, because these, these groups do move around, um, I don't want to give too much away because right, sorry, Spoiler. on Thursday, but no, there, um, uh, it's a, a group of uh, birds called monk parakeets, and uh, like I said, they they have been spotted in Kane County, but the the larger colonies of them tend to be, um, the one that I went to see was over in Lombard. Uh, there's another one in Elmhurst. Um, they were somewhat famous for living in Hyde Park, although they've kind of dispersed from there over the years. Cool, though. Keep an eye out for him. See if he comes back. All right. right, Will do. Thank you. Sure. Anybody else? Hey, Pam. It's Kim. I, I was just wondering, do you know how long the pelicans stay here? Um, you know, I don't have dates in front of me. Kim, um, it's usually, um, they, they come through in waves. And I think some of the ones we saw a few weeks ago have moved on. And now we're seeing another wave moving through. Um, I've heard that some of them are now staying and nesting in this area, not in this area, but in Illinois, um, oh. on, on the Illinois River. And I know, um, gosh, this was a, a few years ago, I was driving through Oregon, Illinois, and it was July, and there was a huge group of them um, hanging out there in July, which seemed like an odd time to be in Illinois, unless they had already bred here. They didn't have their breeding bumps anymore. Um, but they, uh, I would say if you want to see them look soon, because they probably that those, these waves are going to start to slow down and they're going to, because they're going to want to get up to their, um, uh, their breeding habitat. Uh, if they're not sticking around in Illinois, they're heading up to the, the, the prairie pothole region and the, the Northern Plains, like North I, I just saw a small flock at um, Lake Run Forest, Flying oh. on, on Tanner Road, there was about eight in line. So, yeah, I've heard out on, um, yeah, is it Tanner Road? Tanner. Yeah, Tanner near Deer Path. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, somebody had asked me. Um, they said, well, well, why don't we see brown pelicans here? And brown pelicans are more, they are more of a coastal bird. Uh, and even though they're, they're both pelicans, the white pelicans and the, the brown pelicans both have that big pelican-like bill, uh, they feed in different ways. If you've ever been in, say, Florida and you've seen a pelican, a brown pelican up in the, the air, they, they um, much like an eagle or an osprey, they're looking for fish from up high. And when they see one, they dive down and they plunge into the water and scoop it up with that pelican, that net-like uh, bill that they have. But the uh, the white pelican, they, in fact, a lot of times they'll do this cooperatively where they'll work together to kind of herd uh, fish together into shallow water and then they scoop them up like a net. They don't dive. So they don't need the deeper water that we see, you know, along our coasts. They can um, fish quite nicely here in the shallow depths of, say, the Fox River or um, some of like Carson Slough or Nelson Lake Marsh or um, that pond out there on Tanner. So same, same name, pelican, but very, very different styles of feeding. 
which is pretty cool. Well, they sort of, I've seen them in Florida a lot, but I mean, they certainly do look different. Yeah, yeah, and that, that, um, that diving, I always think of, you know, diving in a swimming pool, you, you never want to dive where it's too shallow. And so pelicans, you know, the brown pelicans, they stay where the water's deeper out uh, in our, our coastal areas. But yeah, I would say if you want to see pelicans, get out there soon because it, it won't be too much longer and they'll be done moving. <laughs> Anybody else? No. Laura McKenzie, I know you'd sent, um, this was kind of a curious thing. And if, if you're out and about in Geneva, you might want to check out Island Park where uh, I'm guessing it's the Geneva Park District had planted a lot of arborvitae. Um, arborvitae is a, a white cedar. It's supposed to be beaver resistant, but Laura, uh, what you showed me sure didn't look <laughs> like it was being resisted. Um, the beavers have been um, munching on the, the arborvitae in uh, Island Park. And I, I always kind of get worried uh, when, when they're prevalent, uh, when they're active in a very prominent location like Island Park. Um, I don't know if you've heard about uh, those beavers up in Deerfield. Um, there's a, uh, I think it's only two or maybe three beavers, um, but they are living in a retention pond and the management company for that subdivision has decided they were going to uh, trap the beavers and um, beaver removal occurs in a lot of suburbs. Um, a lot of towns just they have a um, a policy where they 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 you know they have to remove them because residents complain about damage to their landscaping. Um, it's not really easy to relocate beavers. They're they're very territorial. They're they're big animals, um, and the the area is pretty much saturated with beavers. You can't really pick a beaver up and and put it somewhere else without it offending the resident beavers of that area. So really, um, uh, lethal methods are usually what's employed. But there's a, a group in Deerfield that's determined to uh, save the beavers of their subdivision, and I'm. Curious to see how that all plays out. I haven't seen the news today. I know they, they got quite a bit of press over the weekend for the, the protests that they were holding. Um, but then when, when uh, Laura McKinsey, when you showed me what's going on in Geneva, I wonder if that's going to be allowed to continue or not. So something else to keep an eye on. Anybody else? Yeah, Pam. Um, uh, the other place I just, I showed you a couple pictures you want to see a, um, a lot of beaver activity was that I took a trip to Lyman Woods in, in Downers Grove. Downers. Yes. And the, they have had to manage the dams, you know, um, I actually, it, it was so huge. They just cut a hole right, right through it. Um, I, you know, I, I'm not sure there, it was on the weekend, so there was no one there to talk to about it. But uh, we went lower down to the pond and a lot of beaver activity, a lot of fresh, um, but uh, and a huge lodge. It was just really cool to see if, if anyone wants to venture out uh, to Downers Grove. Lyman Woods. Yeah. Good to know. Yeah. Um, well, and, you know, I, I, here at the Park District, we've had uh, cases over the years where beavers have shown up in places where they weren't welcome, and it's, it's a tough decision. I, I always tend to look at, you know, it's an animal that can cut down trees with its teeth. Um, you know, it, it deserves, um, you know, some consideration. It's just doing what its, um, you know, its instincts are telling it to do, but they, um, uh, the, the Lyman Woods area, um, is, does it look as though there's any chance of it uh, causing problems with flooding or anything there? Because that's, that's the other thing. Besides the chewing on valuable landscaping plants, the other complaint we get is, well, you know, now the, the uh, snow melt or the rainwater isn't able to flow freely because the beavers have come in and uh, dammed it up. Well, that was the interesting part too. I mean, it's a fairly large park there, um, and but but it is surrounded a lot by you know larger buildings, some uh, big businesses. Um, you can hear a lot of traffic when you're there, unfortunately. But to me, it didn't 
didn't look as if it would cause trouble, but mm -hmm. it was quite obvious that they really had punched a hole through it and that you could see some older dams too, where mm -hmm. they had done the same thing. So there must be some reason that they feel they need to do it. It, it must impact in some way, e either the park itself or the surrounding businesses. Okay. Yeah. You know, um, up at um, uh, James Pate Phillips State Park, uh, they used to call it Tri-County State Park up on Stearns Road. There was a lot of beaver activity on uh, Brewster Creek up uh, that runs near there. And um, the beavers were, were building dams every say 50 yards or so. And they were um, trying those methods that you mentioned, putting holes in the middle of the dam to try and, and get the water to move through there. Um, and it met with, with some success. I know it, it really changed the ecology. Uh, there were some somewhat rare mussels called slipper shell mussels that had moved in uh, that were living in, in the creek there, but the beaver activity changed the ecology so much that the, the uh, silt buildup behind the dams actually buried the slipper shells, and I, I don't think they're found there anymore. So just like they say, you know, it's nature's engineers, they can um, really change uh, what would be a, a free-flowing uh, stream ecology sort of an ecosystem into a a still water, um, marshy type of growth um, over time. So uh, it's, again, I, I think it's just amazing that an animal can do that. We think, you know, as humans that we're the ones that are in charge and make all the changes, but boy, you put a beaver uh, to work and um, what they can do to a, a area in a relatively short amount of time is really, really incredible and fun, I think. That's just me. <laughs> Anybody else? Um, if not, I uh, look forward to seeing y'all next week. Um, next week will be uh, two days before Earth Day. Um, don't know if you'll you know, be able to join us if you've got big Earth Day plans, but hopefully you'll be able to carve out an hour uh, next Tuesday night on April 20th. Look forward to seeing you then. So have a great night, everybody. Thanks so much for joining. Thank you, Pam. Thanks, Pam. Thank Thanks, Pam. Great to see y'all. Thanks, Pam. <laughs>